All right. Well, good evening and welcome to Peregrine Audubon's presentation of the history and biology of Clear Lake fish um, by Greg Giusti. And you'll get an introduction to that in just a few minutes. Um, my name is Mari Dezella de Santa Ana and I am on the Peregrine Audubon board along with many wonderful other people. And um, we are very happy to be having this as the second part of a two part series that we started last month with um, Harry from uh, Clear Lake who talked about the geology of um, the lake. And I want to encourage you to come to our next program on March 15th, which is going to be Ken Sobin, who's gonna talk about the natural history of saw wet owls. That's gonna be a very interesting evening. And also to go to our website, peregrine.org. Oh, peregrine I think it's Peregrine Audubon. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. PeregrineAudubon.org. And um, join as a member. And also, that's a good place to donate. Um, so we are going to get started. Ryan is going to be introducing our speaker for tonight. And um, he is on our board also. So thank you, Ryan. You may take it away. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Marcella. And good to see everybody. Um, yeah, Ryan Kiefer, a uh, board member at large. And by at large, I mean, I moved out of California. But um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce Greg Giusti. He was um, a UC farm advisor in our forestry and wildlife ecology. I think I got that kind of close. Uh, for Lake and Mendocino counties for over 30 years. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with him in my prior uh, position, working for the county of Mendocino. And yeah, um, I'm just really excited to, to have him here tonight. So Maricela and I will be kind of monitoring the chat box and admitting people to the meeting. Um, but if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, for those of you who don't know where the chat box is, I'll post a message here um, right now. And yeah, put your questions there and we'll proctor them at the end of the meeting to Greg. So yeah, I'll uh, hand it over to Greg and we'll get going. Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, can everybody hear me? Ryan, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Sounds good. And can everybody see my screen? It has my title slide up. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you, Ryan, for helping us with the uh, technology of the day. Uh, admittedly, you know, <laughs> of my generation, this, this Zoom stuff is pretty Star Trek level technology. You're talking to a guy when I started my career. I remember how excited the office got when we got a fax machine. So this is this is pretty pretty fancy stuff, and um, I know as much as I would much rather be talking to you in person, uh, it has given us a chance to stay somewhat connected uh, with with people and to to enjoy each other's company and and share some some ideas. You know, when when Ryan gave me this title, I was. I was taken back because, uh, you know, I've talked about the biology of fishes. I've talked about some of the geology of, of Clear Lake, like like Harry Lyons did to you last month. But he threw in the word history, and when you think of the history of Clear Lake and the history of fish on Clear Lake, it's an amazing story. And this is this is my interpretation of that story. If because of that word, he asked me to address. If you ask 10 people to talk about the history of Clear Lake or the history of Clear Lake fishes, you would get 10 different stories because it, the, the amount of information, the, the human interactions with Clear Lake have gone on for so long and there's been so much study on the lake and, and it's, it's not a finished story and you'll see that by the end of my presentation, but it's, it's really, the you know, thank you, Ryan, for including that word because it gives me a chance to talk about linking not only the fish, but um, 
but the lake. And, and to understand the fish is to understand the lake and what has happened to the lake over time and how that's influenced the fish. So with that, um, oh, and just one little side note to give you an idea of, of some, of the, some of the past history of Clear Lake. In 1891, the California Fish Commission recognized that Clear Lake and Blue Lakes on Long Highway 20 were having an issue with carp and they wanted to reduce the number of carp. So they had a great idea that in 1891, the commission commissioned a study to evaluate the potential of introducing California sea lions to Clear Lake and Blue Lakes. The reason they came up with this idea, because that was the strategy they used in Lake Merced in San Francisco. In 1897, they decided against the idea after doing their assessment not because the idea of moving several hundred pound aggressive marine mammals and putting them in a freshwater lake, you know, hundreds of miles away from their home was crazy, but simply because of the tules that surrounded both of those water bodies would make it impossible for the sea lions to effectively eradicate carp. So I, I love that story. Honest, I can't make this stuff up. I love that story because this irrational idea, this goofy idea, actually had, was resolved with very rational thinking. Not that moving these big animals up to Clear Lake and dumping them loose in there was crazy, but the fact that they wouldn't have been effective. A little side note, those, those sea lions that they dumped into Lake Merced, well, when they ran out of fish, this was before the highways were around, when they ran out of fish in, in Lake Merced, they simply climbed over the sand dunes and went back to the Pacific Ocean. And all of this, all of this is documented in several, several articles that um, I'll refer to tonight. Yeah, I, I think I forgot to mention, I wanted to uh, say you may have heard Greg's voice on the radio doing the ads for, uh, here's a fun fact by Greg Giusti about Clear Lake. Um, I forgot to mention that. Well, there's, plenty, there's plenty of fun facts and there, there's lots of half truths that people have made <laughs> up about, um, about the lake. Uh, the pandemic isn't the only source of misinformation out there. There's plenty of misinformation on Clear Lake uh, because of all of the inputs that people have had over the years. So anyway, let's look at this. And where a lot of my talk is coming from is an annotated bibliography that you can see that Ryan helped with and uh, Ms. Weber and Lisa Thompson. Um, Ms. Weber was a, was a student at Sacramento State that we hired. Uh, Lisa Thompson was the uh, inland fisheries biologist with UC Davis, myself and Ryan. We, we, we went through the literature, what we call the scientific literature, the gray literature, anything we could find on that had to do with fish over all time uh, in Clear Lake. And as you can see, we found 302 references. And you can see the journal articles, books, reports, newspapers, videos, focusing on fish of Clear Lake. I have to admit, I, I may not have read all 302, but I put a pretty good dent in those over the years. And in fact, I, I actually took a study leave in, in 2012 uh, to review all of, the, all of the articles I could find, particularly on Hitch, but generally on fish on Clear Lake. Side note is I took that study leave in uh, Florence, Italy. So the setting was pretty good, but I did study. I did work on learning about those fish and, and reading all this material. So a lot of what I'm sharing with you tonight, I've, I've extracted from uh, about a hundred years worth of, of um, scientific study and interest in Clear Lake. Um, and some of these, some of these older articles uh, writers of the day, you know, they, they were much better at telling a story uh, about what they were writing about than, say, scientific journals today. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of flavor and a lot of flair in a lot of these older journals, and they, they really are fun reading. Well, you know, what do we know about Clear Lake? Well, as I'm sure Harry explained to you last week, we know that Clear Lake is very old. And uh, we know that depend, and it wasn't always just one lake. It shifted back and forth because of geologic and volcanic activities. And uh, you know, we know that the lake 
somewhere two, two and a half million years old. It used to be two lakes, now it's one lake. Um, but you stop and think about it, you know, people, Homo sapiens have been around for about 350,000 years. So I like to remind people is that Clear Lake was around before people were people. It's uh, one of the oldest lakes in the world, certainly the oldest, um, maybe in the top two of the United States or North America, but it's probably in the top five of the world. We know that people have been a part of Clear Lake for a very long time. Archaeological digs have found evidence of human beings uh, be living near the lake going back um, some, some articles stretch it back to 11,000 years, which is right at the end of the last ice age. Uh, clearly by 8,000 years ago, uh, communities of people were established around the lake. And with so much of California, uh, there are a number of existing legacies that continue to be challenging today. Uh, this is a picture of the Herman pit down in the um, left-hand corner. And it's the old mine tailing pit from the sulfur Sulfur Bank Mind. Um, sil first sulfur was extracted, later quick um, cinnabar, which is the ore containing mercury was extracted. And in the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, this was one of the uh, primary producing mines in California, producing over that period of time, millions of pounds of mercury that was used in the process of extracting gold during the gold rush and, and post gold rush years. Um, unfortunately, in the 1800s, people might not have been as sensitive to uh, mind waste uh, laden with mercury and um, that mercury did get into, the, um, get into the system and it's still in the system today. So, um, you know, past decisions, just like decisions we make today will, will possibly linger uh, with, with people that come long after us. But the mercury has been a uh, mercury and, and the process of mercury going through the lake and the fishes has been um, a, a focus of study for a number of years. Uh, and as I said, so even though people have been here a long time, there's a long history of fish and people on Clear Lake. Uh, the archaeological record shows very strong evidence, admittance of um, uh, of people eating fish. Uh, primarily tule perch and thick-tailed chub dominated these mittens. Tule perch are a resident non-migratory fish, probably pretty easy to trap with tule traps and the like in the shallow waters of the lake. Uh, thick-tailed chub, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking more about them, once very abundant in, uh, in California. Uh, they're now extinct, but it, it appears, we don't know a lot about their natural history because they, they checked out so early. Um, but it appears that whatever these folks were doing back in the day, uh, they were quite good at catching tule at uh, thick tail chub and uh, were, were a mainstay in their diet. Other species like Clear Lake Hitch and uh, Clear Lake Split Tail are migratory, coming up in the winter months when creek flows are high. And uh, so those fish were, were widely available, uh, but were seasonal. And so, um, uh, th those fish were, were dried and cured and um, preserved so, so people could, meet, could eat them over time, while these other fish may have been a source of fresh meat uh, for folks living around the lake. We know that Clear Lake at one time was bigger and actually included Blue Lakes. They were connected. Um, and because of volcanic eruptions and subsequent land, land slides, the, the landscape was changed. Next time you drive from Ukiah, driving east on Highway 20, you go up over the big hill and you drop into uh, Blue Lakes. That's an ancient slide that blocked the river that blocked Clear Lake from draining to the Russian River. I'll, I'll let that sink in for a minute. So at one time, Clear Lake's drainage went to the west. After that huge slide, and this is, I don't know when it happened, I just know it happened a long time ago. Uh, after that slide occurred, the uh, geologic record suggests that the lake rose 60 feet above its current height and found an easterly exit um, through Cache Creek and now drains to the Sacramento River watershed. And so, interestingly enough, because over geologic time, Clear Lake has been connected both to the Russian River and later to the Sacramento River, it shares a fish assemblage from both systems. 
And there on the, on the right, you'll see the list of fish that can be found in both the Russian River and the Sacramento River watershed. And I, I put steelhead and Pacific lamprey. Uh, and as you see there, they are no longer, they're no longer able to reach Clear Lake, though there's strong evidence that they were here. Uh, but when the, when the Rumsey Dam was built in 1914, it essentially blocked the upstream migration from the Sacramento River and no longer allowed steelhead trout, sea run uh, rainbow trout, and Pacific lamprey to come up Cache Creek, come over the rocks, and come into Clear Lake and get up into the tributaries and spawn. There are trout in the tributaries of Clear Lake. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody doing any DNA analysis to see how closely related they are to either the Sacramento or the Russian River strain of steelhead, but honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if, if they, were, they had some DNA lineage to either one of those two watersheds. I'm, I'm sure that's how those resident trout that are in the drainages today got there. <clears throat> There, there's evidence to suggest that there's still a brook lamprey that can be found up towards the headwaters of Kelsey Creek, um, but it's been years since anyone sampled them, and I don't know of any recent records of anyone going up there and surveying for that particular species. But there may still be a, a resident population of, of a different species of lamprey in the watershed. Well, the unique thing about Clear Lake, it's a natural lake. Why do I even mention that? Well, because all of the other large bodies of water that we're familiar with, Lake Pillsbury, Lake Mendocino, Lake Sonoma, Lake Berryessa, Shasta Lake, uh, Folsom Lake, they're reservoirs, right? They're artificial impoundments, uh, usually impounding a river of some kind. Clear Lake being a, a natural lake has a very different has very different mechanics than a reservoir. A reservoir, and as we've seen in, in Lake Mendocino this last year, reservoirs get flushed every year. Open up the dam, the water is released for any number of reasons and uses, and then the dam is shut and the reservoir fills again. That's how they're supposed to work. So consequently, reservoirs are nutrient depleted systems. Literally, they get flushed every year. Clear Lake, which does not work as a reservoir, has a natural shoreline. Its water is kept in the basin for extended periods of time. And so the nutrients that are held in Clear Lake get recycled and replenished every year. Being a, a mid-level, mid-elevation, warm water system, Clear Lake is an incredibly biologically rich system because of the nutrients. Talk a little bit more about that later. The other thing, the fact that Clear Lake is so shallow, the term that, that is used to describe that is polymictic or multiple mixing. There's no thermocline in this lake. You don't have cold, you don't have warm water sitting on cold water. The water is continually mixed because of not only wind, but because of its shallowness, the Coriolis effect. Remember back to eighth grade chemistry, the Coriolis effect teaches us that, that water in the Northern Hemisphere goes in a uh, counterclockwise movement. And it, the rate, the current, if you will, in Clear Lake has been measured at somewhere, that number there, two to 15 centimeters per second. In other words, it takes about 100 days for the water to circulate between the two arms and the main body of, of the lake. So there is, there is movement of water, and then you have wind that pushes the water, and so, you know, you, we do get buildup of nutrients and, and plants and algae in certain parts of the lake at certain parts of the year as a result of both current and wind. And then when the dam is opened, um, and it's a very complicated legal structure that allows the dam when it can open and when it has to be closed, but there is some flushing that occurs. But even before the dam was, was completed, there's a natural restriction called the Grisby Riffle that would have prevented Clear Lake from draining. So um, again, this is an important, this is an important point because it, it, it reminds us that Clear Lake being a natural lake works very differently than these other artificially impounded waters that are nutrient poor where Clear Lake is very nutrient rich. 
another uh, another component that affects water and affects fish movement. If you see right here, there are a number of dams on Clear Lake. Uh, many of these were built with flood control monies many, many years ago. And there's the one, the one dam affecting, and this is the picture of the Rumsey or the Cache Creek Dam uh, that was built in 1914. And as I said, that dam more than likely uh, prevented winter run coastal steelhead and Pacific lamprey from coming up Cache Creek during high flows when Cache Creek rich, reached the Sacramento River and were able to come up and spawn. But that is, that is an effective barrier now for uh, migratory anadromous fish that once may have used Clear Lake. Uh, just an interesting side note, uh, because of some of the past agreements, very similar, this is gonna sound similar to Lake Mendocino and, and water rights in Lake Mendocino, but years ago through a number of, of um, decisions and agreements that have been challenged in court, the surface waters of Lake County belong to Yolo County. They, they own the water. And so in order for Clear Lake to do anything with surface water, they essentially need permission from the Yolo County Agricultural and, and Irrigation District. Uh, the dam is, is managed based on how much water's in the, uh, in, the, in the lake at the beginning of the season versus how much is in the, the lake at the end of the season. Obviously right now, there's not enough water. There wasn't enough water last year. There probably won't be enough this year for any downstream diversions for agricultural or commercial use in Yolo County. But, that's a story unto itself. If you ever really want to get, get into water law, look at Lake County and it's, it's pretty convoluted. We know that because of, of Clear Lake's rich and abundant nutrients, stuff grows in the water. Uh, the water can be 80 degrees in the summertime. Yesterday I was on the lake and you know we've had a, we've had a period of warm water. The, the water yesterday, the surface water on Clear Lake was 53 degrees. That's 10 degrees above what it should be this time of year. Normally, January, February, first part of March, the water can easily be in the low to mid 40s. And uh, it, you know, just a couple of days of warm water with it, because it's shallow, it starts to heat up. Uh, and because the water gets warm, because it's nutrients laden, because the water is shallow and sunlight can reach the bottom, plants grow. And in most cases, uh, the, the algae is not problematic. You see algae blooms in, uh, in blue lakes. Some days it's brown, some days it's kind of a milky green. Uh, you know, those are nutrient laden systems and, and those microscopic plants will grow. We talk about clear lake problems, we talk about blue green algae or cyanobacterias that have been historically problematic. A lot of that, those problems have been exacerbated by uh, past land use practices, mostly sediments going into the lake, but not all sediments. Uh, but just from uh, road building and, and other, other factors that, um, that drive this system and drive these plants where they, they can be noxious. They, they, they can be a real problem for folks living along the lake. A lot of work has been done looking at the water quality of, of Clear Lake because it affects so much of what people and, and animals depend on. Uh, like Lake Tahoe, there's a tremendous amount of nitrogen that's deposited out of the atmosphere into bodies of water. And uh, this, this is not uh, unique to Clear Lake. As I said, one of the challenges facing Lake Tahoe and its clarity is not only sediments, which can be controlled, but atmospheric nitrogen being deposited uh, because of, of the world we live in, because of um, nitrous oxide and, and other components that are a product of, of a modern age. Um, the, the real challenge is things like cyanobacteria uh, they're, they're not good at, um, they need to fix atmospheric nitrogen in order to, in order to bloom. And so here they are literally, these blue-green algae are literally getting fertilized, if you will, from the atmosphere. And um, if we look at some of the past studies, uh, you know, because of this, the high level of blue-green algae and the, and the, the density of the populations, uh, you can see how, how much more elevated uh, these, these populations of blue green algae can be affected. And a lot of Lake County's waters are iron laden. We're, it's volcanic soil, so phosphorus and iron naturally occur in, uh, in the system. So if you, have, if you have erosion coming into the lake that's got iron and phosphorus, 
it just it just supercharges blue green algae and you put it in a nitrogen rich rich environment with warm water and you get these eruptions that we see this kind of this kind of atmospheric nitrogen that causes this eutrophication some people might call it pollution but technically it's not it's not pollution when we have when we have fertilizers coming from agriculture or commercial or other kinds of human induced um, uh, eutrophication that doesn't produce blue green algaes like um, like some of these these naturally occurring uh, items or elements can can occur so we know what's driving it it's, it's just challenging to try and stop this process from happening again going back to horn's work from uc berkeley uh, he they, they really spent a lot of time in the 70s looking at how all of these algaes are affected by atmospheric nitrogen and um, uh, and how how water clarity water quality uh, the impacts on fish the impacts on wildlife uh, how these blue green toxic algaes uh, can grow and um, i know you can read this for yourself um, but it's that last, that last second to the last point. Again, it shows where it's substantially higher in the lower two arms uh, suggests that wind and current, the Coriolis effect, are playing a role in concentrating these these mats, these often foul, putrid smelling mats at the south end of the lake because they're literally getting pushed down there from the currents and um, and the wind. And that that last point again pollution from groundwater and farm runoff. Um, it's, it's just, it, it forms a different kinds of eutrophication. And so there's good evidence that suggests that blue green algaes have always been present, but uh, following World War I and the introduction of, of heavy equipment from all of the surplus materials and all of the earth moving that started in the mid to late 1920s uh, has probably exaggerated the, uh, the condition and caused these blue green algaes to become more more problematic than they may have been historically. So with all that said as background, we know that Clear Lake has biological functions beneficial for both fish and those organisms dependent on fish. If you ever wanna have fun, I'm gonna pull this piece of paper out here. If you ever wanna have fun, just think about all of the fish eating birds that we see on, on, um, on Clear Lake. Two at any time, you can see white pelicans, double-crested cormorants, loons, up to five species of grebes, two species of bitterns, five species of herons and egrets, uh, common mergansers, um, and bald eagles. And you know the iconic fish eagle is, is the osprey. So the fish of Clear Lake provide a lot of substance substances for the, bir the fish eating birds of Clear Lake. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, you know, in the springtime, um, it's a great way to, if you have kayaks or something, just come out, um, not only to look at the, the fish eating birds, but when the yellow headed blackbirds show up, I've seen, I see about one least bitter in a year in the Thule's and um, just uh, rails and Sora, uh, Virginia rail and Sora's. It's, it's a great place to come bird watching uh, when the, before the weather gets too hot, but it really is a, a very lively place. Uh, we know that, as I just explained, we know that Clear Lake is an incredibly complex biological system. We know that it changes seasonally. We know that one year doesn't necessarily mean what the following year is going to look like. We don't know uh, that, you know, what happened five years ago during a dry period that the lake is going to react the same way. Uh, we know that it's been both ecologically and hydrologically altered over the last 150 years. And we also know because of, of these changes that have occurred, it's often maligned due to its water quality. All that said, I just want to give you an example. And my wife, Kathy, has always reminded me, Greg, don't geek out on people, keep things simple. So I, I, want, to show you a, I want to show you a simplified food web that involves a fish. This is as simple as you can make it. <laughs> this, this is actually taken from a PhD dissertation uh, from a student, Colin Eagle Smith at UC Davis. And the reason it's simplified food web, what Colin did, he worked out one pathway. This shows the pathway of how mercury, 
contaminated sediments, and when that mercury becomes hydrogenated, how it moves through the food web, getting up to eventually people if you eat the fish. But this is, this is as simple. And so all of the other ecological functions and all the, you know, if we, we could overlay energy, energy uh, pathways on this, we could, we could, we could put a, a predatory uh, food web on this. We could put the role of one kind of fish in the food web. I mean, you could have layers and layers and layers of these food webs, but this, this just, I think in one picture makes, makes me stop and think, oh yeah, there's a lot going on out there. And there's a lot of interactions from lots and lots of different kinds of fish. Some, you know, that, that one movie, um, one of those Star Wars movies said there's always a bigger and uglier fish out there to eat you. And, and that's the case. I mean, there's a lot of little fish that uh, are born to be eaten by bigger fish. And the bigger fish might be eaten by an osprey or an otter or something else. Um, but this is just one small example of the complexity when you try and dive into a lake like, huh, water pun, when you try and, and uh, get into uh, the details of how a lake works and, and a lake like Clear Lake, as I said, which is such a biological powerhouse. So what we have to recognize when we talk about Clear Lake is we have to recognize that Clear Lake is a sum of its parts and the fish and all of the animals that uh, call Clear Lake home are dependent on these parts. This is, this is, these are the drivers that give Clear Lake the ability to support so many animals in the water, on the water, around the water. There's a lot going on. And again, the history of Clear Lake could be, could be a, a quarter course on its own. There's so much fascinating history of what people have done in the past and by that, I mean, even from European settlement times. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we may not have all of the information we'd like to have from before pre-settlement, except some oral histories, uh, but even post-settlement, uh, the, the history is, is fascinating. This is Livingston Stone. Uh, nothing to do with the Kelsey and Stones who are infamous uh, for their, their treatment of Native Americans. This was a gentleman from the East Coast um, he was, as you say, a founding member of the American Fisheries Society, uh, well-respected, well-known, um, highly regarded ichthyologist of his day. And he was really big on uh, procuring eggs and starting hatcheries and, and getting fish moved around this country. As you look at the bottom of the slide, there was a, a term coined by a more recent author and this, this notion that we could make the fish fauna better in California by bringing fish from other parts of the country, this one author coined it as biological imperialism. People really thought that California was full of trash fish and they had to make California better, in quotes, uh, they had to bring these, these fish from the East Coast. And you could look at that one example uh, of how difficult it was, owing to the difficulty of obtaining moss from the East Coast, the eggs were packed in wet sponges. Other, other eggs were, were collected, fertilized, collected, and packed in wet, saturated burlap bags, layers of burlap bags, and transported by rail. Now, obviously, they didn't all work, but a lot of them did work. And you'll see here in a couple of slides how successful they were, but this this notion that we could use artificial propagation to improve the fish fauna was a driving force um, at, the, at the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. Livingston also gave us some great historical references by which to understand just how prolific some of these native fishes were. This picture was taken in the 1890s. It's uh, on Kelsey Creek. And this is some of Livingston Stone's journal, as you can see it there. And apparently he, he gave very detailed, as I said, some of these earlier writers and investigators were very good at giving descriptive narratives on, on what they, they did day to day. And 
you know, he said, hey, in the, in the wintertime, you can drink the lake out of Clear Lake. You can drink the water out of Clear Lake. Summertime, eh, not so much. It's a little mossy. I'm thinking, yeah, no kidding. Uh, but even though he, he didn't like the quality of the water, he said he'd think it was uninhabitable by fish, fairly teams and swarms with them. Millions and millions and millions of Clear Lake Hitch and Clear Lake Split Tail would come up during the winter runs um, to spawn in the tributaries. Think of, think of salmon, think of steelhead going up streams to spawn. Uh, a number of these fish, a number of these native fish in Clear Lake would come up these streams. And you could see if they, got, if, if they didn't get back before the water dried out or before the, yeah, before the water or the creek dried, they would be stranded. Uh, Stone would say that it, on a picture like this, it was nearly impossible to cross the stream by foot or horse simply because it was so slippery stepping on all the dead fish. But this gives you an idea of just how many fish. This is one little section of one creek. Uh, and from, from even people uh, that were kids in Clear Lake, they don't remember seeing pictures like this, but there are those individuals who have shared with me that every creek, every drainage ditch that drained into a creek, on high years, even the pear orchards, you'd have hitch, thousands and thousands of hitch coming out of the lake starting in February and probably going through about April when the, when the split tails came up uh, and there would be fish everywhere. Well, here's a list by year of uh, starting with stone um, of the fish that were known to occur in Clear Lake at the time of settlement. I'll let you go down through that. So you can see the um, you can see the, the years up there, and you can see this first year, and then the second year. If you look up here to Pacific lamprey, and you look down here at rainbow trout, this this year up here, this was after the um, the, the Cache Creek Dam was built, and from that point on, lamprey and rainbow trout. Um, May not, you know, this, these, I don't know where they found these. There are, there are fish every once in a while, somebody will catch a fish in the lake, but um, it, it, it's just another example of how that, how that dam may have affected these fish from moving up. And these fish here that were caught, uh, again, could these other fish later on could have easily been uh, found uh, near the mouths of creeks. Because even, even my son, as a young, a young boy, he'd go up Kelsey Creek and come home for lunch with a couple of trout, get up high enough in the system and he knew where to find them. But many of these fish are probably not common to, to most folks. Um, and if you look over here, you can see which ones are still in the lake, which ones have been uh, extirpated. So we have um, pigtail chub, which is, is, is extinct in the state, uh, the hardhead, which is no longer in Clear Lake based on lack of evidence, but still found in the Russian and the Sacramento rivers, uh, Clear Lake split tail. Split tails are still found in the Sacramento, but uh, these fish probably blinked out in the 70s. And then um, Pacific lamprey, again, still found in, in both river systems, but no longer found in, um, in Clear Lake. So, oh, what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 species of native fish. Uh, were known to occur in Clear Lake pre-settlement. Then with the help of Mr. Stone and others, this gives you an idea of the species of fish that, were that have been introduced into Clear Lake. The, uh, the year they are thought to be that the introduction that was successful took hold. And then I think for me, it's more, in, it's my, my eye turns to those uh, introductions that failed, uh, the pickerel, the golden shiner, the lake trout. Um, and, and in some of these, I've, you know, they tried more than once. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any record. I know that in that last slide, we talked about mountain whitefish. I, I couldn't find a, a year for those exactly, but that was another species that was uh, uh, introduced, but the, the introduction failed. Down here at the bottom, goldfish are quite common in Clear Lake, but there's no date of introduction. There's a really good chance that somebody just sometime long ago just dumped an aquarium full of goldfish in the lake and, and they took off. Um, but you can see some of these, some of these introductions 
uh, happened fairly recently in, in our lifetimes, at least my lifetimes, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Um, so some of these introductions have occurred fairly recently. Others like crappie and bluegill and bass uh, happened uh, well over 100 years ago. And you can go out there and catch these things. Interestingly enough, I think most people would be quick to recognize, you know, the, the introduced species that that are found here. Uh, I, I, I've got a feeling not many people would know what a, a Clear Lake split tail or a, a Clear Lake hitch would look like, but I'm sure most people would recognize a catfish or or down here a carp, or a little bluegill, or, or a black bass. This is a, a smallmouth bass. Um, so you know, the fish that that people are familiar with people they, they they angle for if you will they fish for are for the most part all introduced fish into California uh, all east of the Mississippi River. So again, I think if you if you look at the fish fauna of Clear Lake, the the minnow family and I, in, in our jargon we use the word minnow to describe a small fish. Well, there's actually a a family of minnows, the Cyprinidae. Uh, which are very well represented in California fish fauna. This is just three examples uh, that were found in, uh, in, in Clear Lake. As I say the hardhead is no longer found, but you can find these in the Russian and the Sacramento River. But there's a list, the pike minnow, formerly qual called the squawfish, hardhead, hitch, split tail, blackfish, and chub. These are all members of the minnow family. And uh, you can see some of these things get quite large. So as, as I said, we use the term parochially to, to describe a small fish, but um, there is a whole group of fish that are in the minnow family. So it'd be like the Icteridae, the difference among blackbirds and you know, how, how varied blackbirds are. Um, you, know, you can't say, well, you've seen one blackbird, you've seen them all. Well, same thing here. You can't say, well, I've seen one minnow, I've seen them all. Uh, very well uh, distributed and well represented throughout the fish fauna, not only of Clear Lake, but of, of all our local waters. And with all of these different fish, there's this is part of the biology part that that uh, Ryan asked me to talk about. You know, there's a list of those species that come up the creeks to spawn, uh, have almost uh, a salmon or steelhead-like uh, life cycle, and then there's those that are spawn in the lake, and you you can see the list. Um, obviously, these these fish that spawn in the creeks are so, they they come up in the winter when uh, when flows are high. Um, they got to move fast because these these creeks can drop for fairly quickly, but um, they'll they'll lay their eggs. The adults will move back down to the creek. The young will hatch in seven to ten days, and then maybe spend another ten days or so in the creek. But all the while, once they can start moving, they start moving down towards the lake to get in the tule beds to hide. Um, it's it's thought that uh, split tails came after hitch in spawning, so. Hitch usually come in February. It's thought that hitch, or excuse me, split tails may have come in late March or even April. Uh, one of the reasons they may have checked out of, of the Clear Lake system is uh, with water diversions, possibly drying um, those streams up uh, before they were able to complete their life cycle. Again, that's just that's just the hypothesis, but it's it's one knowing that those fish may have come up later. It's one that that may have been a, a contributing factor to their demise, though there were certainly others. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, I can still, we can still see Sacramento pike minnow and Sacramento suckers coming up with the hitch. Uh, and they should be up now. If, if there was, again, I was on the lake yesterday. There's virtually no flow in any of the creeks. I don't think there's enough to entice fish to come up. If we ever get rain again and we get a good flush, pike minnow, Sacramento suckers, and hitch, they ought to be ready to come running up here and, 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 um, and spawn. Uh, lake spawners, you can see right there, these fish, uh, they have different life cycles on how they spawn, how they raise their young, but uh, they do not, they do not uh, migrate up the streams and uh, live their entire lives within the uh, confines of the lake. Well, you know, people say, well, what do they look like when they're little? Well, I always say there are two eyes and a wiggle. I mean, they all look the same. These things are part of the, they're part of the zooplankton. They're, they're drifting around out there. Um, and, you know, like, Zooplankton of things like rotifers and um, oh, what's on there? Cladocerans, all these little, all these little buggy things you saw under a microscope when you took a drop of uh, pond water. 
Um, they're incredibly important food items for fish that are filter feeders or for baby fish that can see these things. Well, when you're small, <clears throat> like a largemouth bass or a hitch or a crappie or a sculpin, you're so small, you're actually part of the zooplankton and predation on these little fish is incredibly high. That's why in a year like this, <clears throat> excuse me, when the, when the lake is low and these little fish can't get into the tule beds and are out in the open water, they're lunch. Uh, mortality rates can be extremely high on these small fish uh, if they can't get in the tule beds to uh, find refugia. <clears throat> I just wanted to pull out one of the one of the fish, <clears throat> the native fish. It's also found in the Russian River. Cool little fish. It's the only fish in Clear Lake that bears live young. And really interesting uh, life cycle. It breeds, right? They mate in July to September, but the eggs are not fertilized in the female until January. So she just kind of holds on to the to the male sperm until she can she can fertilize her eggs. So then you have more of a synchronized um, <coughs> time of, of spawning. And you know when you when you're laying eggs, you can lay thousands of eggs. They don't take up much space. But when you lay when you're giving birth to live animals, uh, there's only so much room in there to put baby fish. So depending on the size of the female, you can see sometime in May or June which is a time when bass and, and crappie and bluegill and other fish are coming up into the shallows to spawn, uh, she'll give birth anywhere from 10 to 60 live fish. And they're, they're tenacious little things. They're, they're really, they're actually kind of cute little fish. I, I've seen quite a few of them. Um, you know, they grow very rapidly. Again, they gotta, get, they gotta get big so they can protect themselves and get those spiny dorsal fins up so they don't get eaten. Uh, but they may live up to seven or eight years, which is for a fish is a fairly long time. Uh, and as the name implies, they, you find them around these thick tule beds and they'll dart out and, and catch a little something swimming by and then dart back in the tules for protection. But uh, it's just, a, just one of the unique little life history uh, cycles of a, of a, you don't think of fish um, of giving live birth. So all of the surf perch over in, you know, Noyo Harbor and, and Albion and stuff, they're, they're all in the same family and all those surf perch are live bearers as well. I bet you didn't know there was commercial fishing, fishing on the lake. In fact, Clear Lake, along with the Delta back in the day, set records for how many catfish were caught and sold to markets uh, in Sacramento and San Francisco. <coughs> lots and lots and lots of fish were, were caught. And um, as I said, it was mostly the Delta, but also Clear Lake. The Clear Lake, the commercial fishery on Clear Lake was uh, for catfish closed in 41. I don't know the reason behind that, but I know in the mid 50s, commercial harvesting for catfish was shut down statewide uh, simply because um, people were thought, were afraid that they were getting overfished and uh, would, would not provide a recreational fishery if all of the fish went to uh, commercial markets. So it's, it's no longer legal to uh, commercially capture catfish, but at one time, it was a major fishery, both on Clear Lake and uh, in the Delta. And then even more recently, and I, I know personally, uh, three of the families that, that did this, uh, commercial fishing continued on Clear Lake until about 2001. And the guys just got too old, they retired. Uh, most of them worked in agriculture or logging. So this was their winter employment. They'd, um, they'd use these long nets up to 1700 feet long, these seine nets. They drag them out from shore, make a make a semicircle, come back to shore, and then pull these nets in. And uh, what they were what they were after primarily were Sacramento blackfish, common carp, and what's called silver carp, or they're carp goldfish hybrids. Uh, these fish were were cat netted, as you can see. They take them out by by hand. Here's a big catfish that was released, um, and they were they were put in these live these pens in the lake right there by County Park in Kelseyville and then transported to uh, Asian markets in San Francisco's Chinatown uh, in trucks with with live tanks and um, the the Sacramento blackfish was the was the fish of choice they got the most money for that common carp so they're big maybe up to 20 pounds maybe they'd get somewhere between a penny and a nickel a pound and the silver carp were in the dollar a pound range so um, it's unfortunate these guys retired because, you know, you could go out there and they'd, they'd catch all kinds of fish. They'd catch bass, they'd catch hitch, and they'd catch, they'd catch things. And it was a, 
it was a ready, it was a ready uh, creel census. You could go out there and meet them when they were coming in and you just stand there and watch and see, you know, the fish they were turning loose. You'd have numbers, they had to report all their catch. Um, and so I still have all those data records and um, it's really fascinating. Uh, years and years and years of commercial fishery on, on Clear Lake. As I said, it could, it could start up again anytime uh, those involved simply retired. Well, it's been a tough slog for native fish, uh, again, because of uh, introductions, because of uh, changes to waterways, uh, because of water diversion. Uh, and, a, and a good example is uh, the thick-tailed chub. Uh, here's, you know, striped bass that were introduced in the Delta. That's a, a largemouth bass. It's been introduced to just about every warm water body and pond in California. Uh, but at one time, this, this thick-tailed chub was one of the most common fish in California. And uh, in fact, you know, it was found in Clear Lake, San Francisco Bay, Pajo River, it was widespread. Um, it, was, it, it was commercially sought after and sold in fish markets in San Francisco. And, uh, but because of all of the changes I listed, because of the, uh, uh, the introductions, uh, by 1957, it, it just about checked out and it hasn't been found since. And so since about 1970, it was declared extinct in the state and no one's found one since. And it simply couldn't compete with these, um, these larger fish. These are aggressive predatory fish. Uh, the chub uh, did not grow up, did not evolve with these kinds of predators in its presence, probably had very poor uh, escape defense mechanisms and uh, all of between overfishing, habitat changes, and the introduction of these fish, it simply uh, couldn't survive. And uh, there's, a, there's a number of other ca uh, California and also Clear Lake fish that are in the same boat. Uh, as I said, you know, you've heard me say this before, but past actions that have, affated, that have affected native fish populations in Clear Lake, introductions of these very aggressive predatory fish, Barry, physical barriers to upstream migration. Those are Pacific lamprey down, uh, down in the corner. Uh, water diversions, uh, reducing stream flows and seasonality. Uh, some of these streams most likely were getting dried up before uh, these fish could complete their life cycles. And then pest control actions on the lake that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, more, more impacts on how these fish um, uh, use the lake and its tributaries. This is, these are just three pictures of uh, on, clear, on Kelsey Creek, the retention structure in the left-hand corner, uh, the footings there at the Merritt Street Bridge in downtown Kelseyville, and then the down cutting that occurred upstream from gravel mining over the years, which would have reduced the um, oh, reduced surface flow, um, would cause the water to go sub gravel earlier because it's deeper and then with diversions on the side sucking the water uh, reducing the um what am i thinking of? reducing the aquifer uh, and causing early dewatering of the streams so these these are all still in place and uh fish like hitch and split tail and the suckers and the pike minnow you know these are lake fish they they're not big strong bodied river fish and so they're they're relatively weak swimmers and uh, these two um, impediments, the, the footing on the bridge and, um, and then the, uh, uh, the diversion structure, uh, they, they can't jump over these. They simply can't get over these. And then when the water is up high enough to cover these over, the, the flow is too strong. And so there are miles and miles and miles of uh, a potential spawning ground that's been, that's been cut off to them for, for decades. There's, there's serious effort, there's serious discussions of looking at some of these, uh, all of the native tribes and the Chai Council, uh, a local conservation group that I'm sure many of you know about, uh, you know, there's serious talk about trying to rectify and resolve some of these uh, impasses, um, but it, you know, it costs money and it, it takes time, but uh, people recognize what the challenges are and hopefully some of them, maybe not on all of them, not all the streams, but hopefully on some of them, uh, some of these can be rectified and, and open up some spawning grounds. You can't talk about Clear Lake, you can't talk about fish without talking about Clear Lake gnat and past uh, DDD applications that occurred during those years. These gnats are non-biting 
they're non-biting mosquitoes, if you will. They're called phantom midges. They're tiny, unbelievably tiny. Uh, their, their larvae live in the muds of Clear Lake. Uh, they, they would swarm in the, in the summertime. And as you can see down there, I mean, they, they were so thick, people literally couldn't walk down the street without inhaling them. And you know, post-World War II, there was this magic solution called DDT and DDD uh, that were applied um, to, to eradicate these kinds, of, these kinds of problems. And uh, it was very effective. Unfortunately, uh, another impact to the Clear Lake split tail, according to Peter Moyles at UC Davis, the split, these, these gnats would form huge mats on the lake, not only their bodies, but the eggs that they laid. And um, Peter feels quite strongly that there's evidence to suggest that the split tail and even the hitch relied heavily as a, on, these, on these gnats as a protein source uh, and would feed on them heavily. And so as, as this food item uh, diminished. There's still a few around. They're, they're, they're still here. They're not totally eradicated, uh, but nothing, nothing like the numbers that were reported historically. Um, as these numbers declined, it was probably another uh, cumulative impact on the, on the split tail and their reliance on this food source. I put the book cover up there, because I'm sure many of you know, the chapter four of Rachel Carson's book uh, dealt directly with this item, this, this topic of uh, how, the, how DDT uh, caused impacts to the grebes on Clear Lake, to uh, eagles. Uh, I don't know if she mentioned the fish, I don't recall, but uh, the, you know, it, it changed Clear Lake's fish world, uh, these applications. And, and uh, methylparathion was actually used uh, during the 70s. It's not, it doesn't seem to be as uh, um, persistent as DDT, DDD was and is. And the, there's, there's trace, element, trace, um, trace elements of this material still in the muds of Clear Lake, but um, uh, not enough to, it may, it may be inhibiting an emergence, a total emergence of these gnats, uh, but it, it, hasn't, it hasn't eliminated all of them. And then again, uh, another interesting side story of the history of Clear Lake was the introduction of, uh, of non-native fish, particularly uh, thread thin shad and in silver sides. Uh, these were in, the silver sides were introduced illegally in 1967 and just exploded. Uh, they're planktonic feeders, they feed on the plankton. Um, you can see some of the numbers on the left there when, um, you know, and I've, I've gone out and done some, some seining uh, with the vector control folks and, you know, pulling in a seine net when, when populations of silver sides are high and you can only walk out off the shore five or six feet. Uh, this was not an unusual sight uh, in the seine net. Just millions of these fish in the lake, literally little vacuum cleaners going through, uh, feeding on zooplankton, directly competing with both native and introduced uh, juvenile fish. Because th this is as big as these fish get, a couple of inches long, um, and uh, they just spend their entire life feeding on zooplankton. You can see that one number there from one, uh, uh, one reference, you know, a, d a density of 400 to 800,000 an hour passed by a fixed point. Somebody in a boat, you know, doing some, some kind of calculations uh, estimated that that's how many were coming through. They're cyclic. I haven't seen big numbers of these uh, in the past couple of years. They're always out there. You see them, see these schools of them. Uh, but in, when they are abundant, I'm not exaggerating, I've seen schools that would be as big as a house, I mean, just 70 feet long, 70 feet wide, uh, just massive clouds of these fish just below the surface coming out to feed. And in years like that, they are considered the most abundant fish in the lake. So again, another past decision. Well, this wasn't even a, a conscious decision, probably somebody in the bait bucket threw them in there. And um, they've, they've impacted, they can impact both uh, commercially important and in, in introduced species as well as native species. Well, what's the story today? The story today is fish on. Clear Lake is a bucket list destination for fresh water, warm water game fish. There's competitive angling tournaments, if you will, for bass, catfish and crappie to the tune of a hundred a year. Now they're not all big, 
some of these tournaments might only have 15 or 20 boats. The, for example, the Sonoma tubers, they, they're up in, uh, in be, what we call belly boats or tube boats. Uh, their kayak fishing has become very popular and there's competitive kayak tournaments. All of these tournaments have to register through the Department of Fish and Wildlife in Sacramento. So we have a good list of uh, who's in it and then who's coming. Uh, but more important, you know, so you have a tournament, maybe you have a one day tournament on Saturday. Well, guys might, people, men and women, guys and gals might show up on Wednesday or Thursday and start pre-fishing and spend money here, you know, getting a hotel room, going to dinner. Uh, arguably, uh, fishing on Clear Lake is the primary tourist draw, draw for, um, uh, for Lake County. I know the wine industry doesn't like me saying that, but facts is facts. Uh, the study I did without even trying, fishing generates at least a million dollars in revenue to local businesses. And that's with just terrible, terrible data sources. It could be several times higher than that. Uh, rec there's recreational fishing, like I was yesterday, me and a buddy. We were out pre-fishing for a tournament next month we're in for bass, catfish, and, and crappie and bluegill, take a kid fishing kind of thing. Um, there's competitive bow fishing for carp. There are tournaments where people will come out, uh, have specially rigged boats and go out and shoot carp and then weigh them at the end of the day. Um, there's, got, there's at least 13 guides working the, uh, working the lake, bringing people, bringing clients out for, for pay for half day or full day trips. And you can fish from a boat and you can fish from shore. So it's, um, there's a lot of fishing goes on in Clear Lake. Uh, and, you know, pretty good money fishing. And there's just a picture of guys coming in, boats coming in to check in. This is down in uh, Redbud Park in Clear Lake. Uh, boats coming in from one of the larger tournaments. These large tournaments might have 120, 150 boats. There's a couple of tournaments that uh, first prize is $100,000 um, or maybe uh, $40,000 in cash and a new $70,000 bass boat. So th these are serious anglers that participate in these, in these tournaments and they come from all over the Western United States. I'm not kidding when I say Clear Lake is a, a, uh, a bucket list destination. In 2020, uh, Bassmaster Magazine voted it the bass fishery uh, of the decade in North America. Uh, and why? Because the number of fish you can catch for how much time you put in, the average size of bass compared to other water bodies, access, it's free. All, most of the public boat ramps, except for Clear Lake State Park, they're free and they're open 24 seven. Uh, and consistency. You can go out on Clear Lake, if even a, uh, somebody that's fairly new and kind of a novice, and there's a really good chance you're going to catch fish. Why is all of this, why does all of this uh, happen on Clear Lake? Go back to the earlier slides, because that level of productivity that, that this lake can put out, how, how much food, how much energy that this lake can produce, that these fish can convert to body mass. Uh, it's because of the nutrients, it's because of the warmth, it's because of the amount of prey, it's because of the, the hiding cover for juveniles. As I said, Lake County is this biological powerhouse, and even the hitch, uh, which don't get as much press as the bass, but even hitch grow faster in the lake than they do in either the Russian or the Sacramento rivers. A three-year-old female hitch can reach about 13 inches in three years, and she can produce several thousand eggs. And again, that gets back to the productivity that Clear Lake can support all of these animals and uh, sustain them throughout their lives. Uh, we know, as I said, we know that, uh, you know, that there are certain times of the year when competitive anglers target Clear Lake, uh, March, April, and May are the pre-spawning months. June, July, and August, it's hot. Uh, you know, people wanna be off the water by, by 11 o'clock and, and fish tournaments are restricted. In the uh, spring, you, a tournament could be eight hours in length. In the summer, it can only be six hours in length. So most of the tournaments uh, try and, and hit those March, April, and May months. And then September and October, as things start to warm up, you get a little blip of uh, tournaments again, and then it gets pretty quiet during the, the dead of winter. But there's still, um, there's still people out there. Uh, again, this, uh, this data I compiled it in 2015. Uh, you can see how the depression, the recession in 2014 hit people's expendable money, right? I mean, you've got a big expensive boat that uses a lot of gas. Uh, maybe you got to buy groceries one week and you can't participate at a 
fishing tournament. Uh, but generally speaking, over the long haul, there's about 6,000 competitive anglers a year uh, that come to Clear Lake and uh, to, to see if they can catch a fish of a lifetime. Uh, and as I said, some of these can be quite large. We're several hundred people. There's literally a gallery uh, that uh, at the weigh-in, uh, people are watching the fish being weighed. Some of these pro anglers have, uh, have fans that follow them around. And if they know they're coming to Clear Lake, they'll come up here and either follow them around in the boat or uh, see at the weigh-in and uh, cheer them on to see how they did uh, competing for the day. Um, so this is big business in Clear Lake. And the game changer has been the internet. Like so many things, good, bad, and otherwise, uh, everybody is, has access to instant information. So like in May, 2017, there was a, a unbelievable crappie bite. Uh, the word got out and for the month of uh, April and uh, May, uh, some of the resorts around the lake had to limit the number of people they would allow on their docks because there were so many people, the docks were sinking. Honest to goodness, it, it just goes crazy. I talked to one uh, gentleman just one day and I said, yeah, where are you from? He said, I'm from Fresno. I said, you drove nine hours up here to catch a crappie? He goes, dude, you can't catch fish like this anywhere. And so, it, and again, this instant information, there are so many blogs, there are so many ways to track um, what, what's going on with fish on Clear Lake. It's, it's really, it's mind boggling. Uh, and again, whether it's crappie um, or bluegill, uh, these are fish that people don't see anywhere. And um, because of its reputation, it, it gets a lot of promotion. And as, I, as I've told the wine industry, you spend a lot of money to get people to come to Lake County, uh, you know, but they have to drive, the same thing with Mendocino County, right? If people want to come up and join, enjoy wine for a day, they got to drive through Napa or Sonoma County. Well, not everybody has that much time in a day to do that. But for Clear Lake, you don't have to spend any money, any advertising money to get them here. The fish are doing it on themselves and these national publications are doing it as well. Um, so it's not, you know, if you, if you run in the right circles, it's not hard to come across uh, some kind of advertisement talking about uh, what potential fishing there is on Clear Lake. Those are fish that people would drive from Tennessee to catch and that people do. So is that the end of my presentation or is that even the end of the story? No, it's somewhere in the middle. In the middle. I, I don't know where the end of the story is. The one thing I do know is that nothing is static and that change is an inevitable constant. You look at the changes that have occurred to the fish, you look at the changes that have occurred to the, to the lake, there's more changes that are gonna come. Uh, probably not, not all of them are gonna be very good. There's always the threat of aquatic invasive species, not just fish, right? Other kinds of organisms. Uh, changing weather patterns, it's hotter, it's drier, these long prolonged droughts. Uh, these fish are dependent on getting upstream to, to spawn. If the creeks are dry, there, there's evidence, there's evidence, and people keep reminding me that there's evidence of fish, of hitch, particularly spawning in the shallows of Clear Lake, but there's no evidence that that spawning was successful. You know, if they drop their eggs on the sand and the sand's bouncing along there, well, every, every uh, bluegill or a little crappie that comes along is gonna, gonna eat them. So just because you see spawning behavior doesn't mean the spawning was successful. And I can assure you it's gonna be far less successful if they do it in the lake than if they do it in the stream. And, and then, you know, what do people want? What, what are people's expectations and needs with the pressures and changes that, that we're facing? Uh, this pandemic has, you know, has really hit people hard and people want to get out. They're desperate to get out. They need to get out. And it's going to put more pressures on, uh, on recreational um, attractions like Clear Lake. So here's an example of one aquatic invasive species, uh, quagga mussels. Uh, they can literally overtake a system. So you can imagine if, you know, if these things got in there and there was another billion mouths to feed, feeding on zooplankton uh, and, which, and, and phytoplankton, you know how that could change the, uh, the dynamics of the lake and uh, its ability to grow fish, all fish. And then you know, the, the elephant in the room is um, uh, what, what's, our, what's our future weather gonna be? How's, how's that gonna affect people's psyche? 
How's that going to be people's livelihoods? Uh, how's that going to affect our energy systems? Um, these are these are big, big time questions that uh, th that are yet to be answered. So you know, is this the end of the story? No. Uh, this was my interpretation of of a story that uh, I was asked to share with you. And as I said, if you could ask somebody else to come with the same title, they'd probably do it different, and it, they'd be right because it's a it's a fascinating story uh, that that continues. So with that. Um, it's, it's hard giving a talk when I can't see body language from my audience. So I hope most of you are still awake. I hope you are. And uh, I'm happy to uh, take, uh, I'm happy to take questions or, or comments uh, that you might have. And, and thank you so much for uh, joining in tonight. I really, I'm sorry I can't see you firsthand, but I know you're there. Well, thank, thank you, Greg. We appreciate it. It was, uh, it was great and love seeing the pictures and um, your local knowledge. Uh, we do have some questions already in the chat box, but if people have additional questions or comments, why don't you put them in there right now? But uh, the first question, how deep is the lake? Oh, well, on average, the lake is, you know, the, I mean, it fluctuates, right? It goes up and down. So I'll, I'll pick a number uh, on average between 18 and, and 21 feet. That said, there are some points in the lake that have been measured at just over 50 feet, some volcanic vents uh, and, and the like. But generally, the, the lake is uh, shallow um, in, in a lot of places. Along Highway 20, um, and then uh, on the uh, east side of Mount Kanaktai, where the mountain actually comes down, you know, there's water there that's 25, 30 feet deep. Um, but there are those are specific areas, and the, the number usually is about 20 to 21 feet deep is the average depth. Great. Um, there's a question pertaining to uh, commercial fishing. Would there be an ethical issue of commercial fishing and selling fish from Clear Lake when the mercury levels are as high as they currently are? Well, Clear, Clear Lake's mercury levels are no higher than most other Northern California lakes. In fact, the health advisories for Clear Lake are the same for San Francisco Bay, Lake Pillsbury, Lake Mendocino, Lake Sonoma. All of these waters have been um, affected by mercury. There are specific California Department of Health guidelines for bass, for example. Um, men should, adult men, should not eat more than um, one bass a week. Uh, women and women of childbearing age and children should not eat any bass. Uh, there are, I think there's some um, restrictions on maybe catfish. I'm not aware of any restrictions for the fish that were sold, carp, goldfish, or the blackfish, uh, because of their feeding, because of their feeding um, uh, strategies. If you go back to that simplified food web, you remember those fish were lower on the food web. So the higher up the food web you go, the more chances you can compound mercury concentrations. So the lower down you are to the bottom, uh, the less amount of mercury you have. So. Um, I don't, and I don't believe that those fish that were sold, and I, I've, I've gone through the, the back, back of those Asian markets in Chinatown and, and saw the fish, you know, there were no Prop 65 warning signs or anything like that on them. Um, but, I, but I don't know if they were regularly checked. But if you were gonna eat fish, freshwater fish from any Northern California water, I would check the California Department of Health guidelines. And I think you'd be surprised. Like I said, it, it's not just Clear Lake, it's all the lakes mm -hmm. and the bay. Great. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, let's see. How did the introduction of threadfin shad affect the silver sides? Well, they're kind of working in concert. Uh, they're, they're competitors. They're direct competitors for food. They're both, uh, they both feed on planktonic organisms. They both can grow in extraordinary numbers. Um, 
as far as direct uh, how one affected the other. I'm trying to think if you know if I've seen a silver side eruption concurrent with a shad eruption. Um, you know, some years shad are everywhere. Some years, yeah, they're around, but they they don't like cold water. So if we get a like shad particularly, um, and, and maybe the silver side, but I know this for sure for shad. Yeah, I know this for certain for shad. <laughs> a lot of shirts <laughs> in there. Um, if if water temperature gets below forty one degrees, uh, shad mortality goes up exponentially. They they do die out, so then they have to start back over. It's been several years since I've seen clouds of, of silver side. They too may have been impacted uh, by, by the cold water we had a couple of years ago. But as I say, they both, they, they kind of work in concert as far as their ability to feed on, uh, on zooplankton. Though I've seen young of the year bass, you know, maybe an inch, inch and a half long swimming away from me with a silver side in its mouth. So, you know, the coin flips both ways at some point. Uh, those baby, those, those smaller fish get big enough where they can feed on the silver sides. I have watched, I have watched like uh, both Clark's and Western Grebes uh, when, when both species are, uh, both the shad and the silver sides are abundant. And, you know, if you watch, let's say if you're a geek like me, you count the number of times a bird dives before it comes up with a fish. And so let's say, a, you know, a Western Grebe, it dives five times before it comes up with a fish. Well, on the fifth time, it comes up with a silver side. And on another dive, on its fifth dive, it comes up with a shad. That's the difference between eating a French fry and a cheeseburger, right? So every five dives, you come up with a cheeseburger, you got tremendous energy. You know, you got plenty of energy for egg laying, for, for incubation, for chick rearing, uh, for all the stuff that goes into raising kids as opposed to if you're diving down every fifth dive and getting a French fry, you're expending a lot more energy uh, that you may not have as much free energy to give for all of those other reproductive activities that those birds go through. So it's, it's one of those ideas I thought, God, that'd be a great study. Should have thought of it 30 years ago, but now I got to find somebody to do it. Because I think there's, I think there's something to that where, you know, how, which, even though they're both exotic species, one exotic species of shad, I think, benefits fish-eating birds far more than this other fish because when you catch one, when you like I say, when you catch a shad, it's like catching a cheeseburger. A lot more, lot more energy return for the effort expended. I kind of digressed on that, but I think oh no, that was great. I enjoyed it because it mentioned birds. Um, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> let's see, we do have some more. Uh, were the Florida strain of the largemouth bass only introduced first in 1967? No, I think they were introduced twice. So the first bass that were introduced were northern strain. And uh, generally speaking, the northern strain are slower, are not as aggressive fish, and they tend to not be as big. The Florida strain was introduced. They were considered a better game fish. Um, who made that decision? I, I have no idea. Um, and I, but they were introduced in the 60s and then again in the 70s, early 70s. I think there was two introductions. It was actually Highland Springs, Highland, Sp Highland Springs Lake in Middletown was the brood lake where those fish were initially introduced and then taken from that and introduced into Clear Lake, if memory serves me correctly. And um, so the, the Florida strain bass grow bigger and grow faster. But like I said, yesterday during the winter, they're harder to catch because they're more of a warm body fish than a fish that came, whose genetics came from say Michigan or Wisconsin. So they tend to be kind of sluggish in the winter time, but they, they, they do put on a lot of weight really quick. Great. Uh, are there springs in the lake? Oh yeah, there's. Um, there, there are places around the base of Mount Kanaktai. It looks like somebody dropped a truckload of Alka-Seltzers in the lake. I mean, it's just all this effervescence coming up. Uh, you can actually, the soda baths, there's, there's water that's um, artesian water that's just coming a couple of feet above the lake. There are historic accounts of water coming up in the middle of the lake so forcefully that there was literally a hump of water in the lake. 
and I've asked I've asked people if they've seen that for years and, and no one has. I say some of the old timers, you know, remember it as kids who are now 80 years old. You know, there's a lot of a lot of shaking and moving that goes on around this this volcano. Um, so, something's probably changed, but as far as springs coming into the lake, huge vents, volcanic vents that divers have gone down and found clouds of channeled catfish, baby, baby channel catfish just all balled up swimming in a circle. Didn't know what they were doing, but this was, these were firsthand accounts I got from, from people that put on scuba gear and dove the lake. But some of these shafts go down a, a long way. Great. And there's water. Um, let's Eat see, there, there was a question that pertained to your graph. Um, maybe I might suggest to that person to reach out to you over email um, to go into specifics there, but they, they did post a follow-up question in recent terms what was the main decline to the clear lake hitch and split tail compared to historic numbers well that one picture i shot i think that picture because it was taken so late in the season of all that man standing by all those dead fish i'm pretty sure those were split tails they're gone they're they're no they're, since about 1970 they uh they have not been found so they're they're considered that they've been extirpated from the lake. Um, hitch numbers, there are still remnant runs on Kelsey, Middle, and Adobe Creeks when, when water conditions allow. Uh, nothing, nothing like uh, historic runs. And if you put the list together of what's affected it, obviously, bluegill, crappie, catfish, bass. Um, Obviously, those are big predatory, aggressive fish. Do they eat hitch? Heck yeah, they eat hitch. Um, water diversions, uh, in-stream changes to uh, flow, yes. Uh, upstream impediments for migration, could that have affected them? Yes. Uh, there is still uh, native, native people around the lake still collect hitch um, and, and dry them in, in traditional ways, but that's that's not having any impact uh, to, to speak of, but at one time they were a, a more stable food, food supply. So I, I think with so many California native fish, uh, Clear Lake native fish suffer the same ills. They, uh, they, they've been abused and um, were probably always just you know, benign neglect. Nobody ever really thought about how, these, how land use practices or introductions or water use could affect these, these animals. And, um, they're showing the strains of that abuse. Great. Uh, we do have another question about uh, another local um, wildlife. Uh, which time of year are bears most actively feeding off the lake? Which fish do they consume? Well, any bear with pride will raid somebody's house in Upper Lake before they get to the lake. Um, there, you know, there's not, there's a lot of bears in Lake County, don't get me wrong, especially at the northern end of the lake, Upper Lake, Lucerne, and, and I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, talk, talk to the game wardens around here. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of bear problems up there with people's garbage cans and pet food and all of that. You don't, I mean, a bear, a bear has to cross a highway to get to the lake. There aren't, there aren't carcasses of fish laying everywhere. There never are. Uh, it's an unusual situation when that happens. And we've had a couple of carp die-offs in the years. Uh, there was a, a carp virus, a koi virus that got introduced to the lake, probably somebody dumping some fish, some goldfish from an aquarium, and it killed thousands and thousands and thousands of carp. Uh, but those fish were collected by the county and hauled off in a, to a dumpster. So I, I think, you know, at, at any one time, a bear could come come out of the hills, but there's not there's not a draw. It's not it's not like Alaska where you've got all this bait, this bear bait on the side of a stream uh, or the like. Um, so I, I I don't have an answer for that that question because I, I don't think there is an answer. It's it's going to be a haphazard occurrence if you see a bear roaming along a beach on Clear Lake or along a stream, 
And again, I'd be more than happy to eat the bowl of dog food somebody left on the porch if you can't find the fish. Well, it may not... also may have been more common in the days when those creeks were covered with fish that got stuck there when it was direct when the well, creek. Well, I mean, right if you read if you read Tevis's book, California Grizzly, uh, Clear Lake had one of the highest concentrations of California grizzlies in the state. There's uh, several accounts of uh, Spaniards, not Mexicans, Sp but Spaniard vaqueros going out and capturing a grizzly bear throwing it in a, in a pen with a bull and wagering on who would win. Um, and it's a, great, it's a great read, it's an easy read. It's the, the author is Tevis, written in the 60s, but bears have always been a part uh, of, of Clear Lake, like, like Thule elk, as the name implies. Um, but those, those animals were uh, extirpated from the state in 1922. Um, grizzly bears, California grizzly bears anyway. Uh, but certainly at one time, and, and there are a number of accounts of, of Native Americans being deathly afraid of grizzly bears around, around the lake. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of people got hurt by them. Uh, they're, you know, they're aggressive animals. And I'm sure if folks were out trying to catch fish uh, when the fish runs were in the creek, yeah, they might've had to share some space with some other four-footed anglers. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, let's see, I think we have one last question and uh, it's again refer referring to the the food chain uh, diagram. How high up on the list are the crappie uh, as it relates to mercury? Yeah, they they'd be a, people eat crappie all the time. They I, there's no to my knowledge there's no health warning on eating crappie. Um, they're top two thirds, they're up there. I mean, they, they're gonna feed on, um, you know, chances that they're not gonna feed on crawfish like bass will. They're not gonna eat baby ducks like bass will. Uh, they're not gonna eat other bass like bass will. So, you know, their, their food items are, they're gonna feed on silver sides and they're gonna go after, uh, you know, smaller insects and uh, zooplankton. Um, not, not to say that they won't eat fish that are smaller than them. They certainly will, um, but they're not, they're not eating the quantity that, say, you know, largemouth bass are. Because largemouth, you know, a five-pound largemouth bass, I've seen western grebes regurgitated out of big bass in holding tanks. Oh, oh they, are, they are aggressive predators, and so they get hungry enough. If it swims by, they might try and eat it. Yeah, that's something I'll say. Um, well, yeah, I think that's the questions that we have, Greg. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, Maricela, do you want to say anything here at the end? Well, just thank you so much. It was such an interesting and just I learned so much from it tonight. Thank well, you. I hope, I hope so. I, uh, I'm glad to see my colleague, uh, Supervisor McGordy on there. Thank you, Glenn. I always uh, get together someday. And I know Bobby, Bobby Dutcher was signed on too. And Bobby, along with myself, we're both members of the Lake County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee. So I'm pleased to see that he was able to join us because we, our meetings, we talk about Clear Lake and fish a lot and um, nice to have him join us as well. But it was, thank you, I really, I really appreciate uh, everybody joining tonight and having me and I, I, hope, I hope it was enjoyable for you as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Greg. Yep, it was great. Thank you all so much for being here and we'll see you in March for our next meeting, so. March 15th, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Brian. All right, good, good night, night everyone. everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>